All right. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to another episode of Bring a Hacker to Work Day. Um, I am the host, Tanisha Martin, and I'm joined by my co-host, Rebecca Skeet. And our guest for today is Mr. Leo Serrano. Welcome, sir. Hello. Hey, hello. happy to be here. Awesome. So, sir, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, yeah, so um, I'm an information security architect at a major retail company in the Northeast. Um, I was formerly a uh, red teamer for uh, a uh, telecommunications company in the Northeast, uh, and I've spent uh, seven years in the working in the Philadelphia area. It's been pretty connected. Um, I help organize events such as JohnCon um, and uh, DC215 in Philadelphia. Um, Generally, I just like to make things happen, and um, I love it when the community comes together. Really passionate about this field. Awesome. So, would you consider yourself a, um, a hacker, a pen tester, or what? Uh, what do you do day to day? Um. So, right now, I'm not a hack. I'm not a pen tester formally because it's not my job title. Um. After five years at um, a pretty big telecommunications company, I was kind of burnt out. I wanted to do something a little bit more calm, maybe with a little bit less drama. Um, I don't know if both of you have done pen testing, but uh, everyone always has an opinion on your work. <laughs> and, um, you know, being a security architect is I'm more of a support role. Um, I support projects, I support uh, people, and the political fights are much less. Um, severe let's call it severe and how did you get started as a, a security architect did you go to school for that or um that it's just something you fell into so it's something i fell into um i like to joke that um i just kind of showed up to the information security community and hung around until somebody gave me a job um <laughs> and like you know like but uh basically i went to school to be an accountant an accountant um and I was always good with computers, but I didn't really want to work with computers because I thought the idea of working at a computer all day was not the greatest. Um, I don't know why nobody took me aside and said, you know what accountants do all day, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I finished my accounting degree and I really realized that I wanted to go into, into technology. Um, I hadn't specifically found security yet, but it was starting to um, come up. This is like 2013, 2014. Um, so like, you know, the cybersecurity thing was uh, popping off. I think LulzSec was doing their thing. Um, and I was just trying to get into IT. So I um, so I leveraged my accounting degree to get into IT auditing, um, <clears throat> which is really close to cybersecurity, but not quite there. Um, and as I completed my, um, so I did a master's in IT auditing. Um, and as I was completing that master's, I ran into a professor who told me, Oh, well, if you're interested in cybersecurity, go to uh, Hackers on Planet Earth in New York. It's happening next week. Um, then you'll get to see if you like cybersecurity. Um, and what happened at Hackers on Planet Earth is I found the people who ran the communities in Philadelphia. And uh, that's the part of the story where I showed up and just didn't leave until um, I had a job. <laughs> right. So I was working as an IT auditor. Um, starting to get really passionate about cybersecurity, uh, spending my free time listening to cybersecurity professionals. Um, you know, they told me like, do this project, do that project, do the other thing. Like you, you'll be in, in good shape. So um, I just kept working at it and kept doing what they suggested and stuff kept working. Can I ask a quick detour question ish hackers on planet earth. We're actually going to be there. Um, uh, what is it? It's in July, right? I believe so. Yeah. What was that experience like um, as for the, uh, us who are attending for the first time? Um, what can we expect to experience, especially if it was something that kind of made you stay in the field? Yeah, um, well, full disclosure, I haven't been in a couple of years. Um, I haven't been since they moved to Brooklyn. Uh, but um, I did go twice in a row. Um, it's it's a really good experience. It um it's got kind of like a the vibe is is really really interesting. It's it's way more political. Um, I remember the first year I went, uh, Snowden had just done his thing, um, or yeah, the the Snowden uh, incident had just occurred the year before, 
And I was going to um, hope, and I'm reading about like who's going to be the speaker and all that. Um, and they're talking about Snowden. And it was just really surreal. I'm like, wait, there's an entire conference dedicated to privacy and security, and they care about all that. And Edward and this Edward Snowden guy is going to talk. You know, I had no idea about anything at that point. I just kind of knew that like the leaks occurred. Um, so it's just a very surreal moment. But, um, you know, after going a couple of times, I realized uh, hope is really more privacy focused. And um, I mean, there's some, some good technology there, but it's really about um, community and crowdsourcing stuff more than um, other conferences, I would say. So big community conference, at least last time I attended. Got you. Thank you for that. Um, what are, I know, just like how you mentioned, as far as the, the conference being, I don't know, necessarily a little bit more or different than what you're originally expecting, the same can be true for our general careers. Um, you know, people hear ethical hacker, they hear red team, or even auditing, they assume one thing, but sometimes on the day to day, it's completely different. Um, what are some of the misconceptions that people have had? Um, on your professions and, and across the line or as you've developed and transitioned, uh, what are some of the things that have stuck out to you? Yeah, I mean, uh, number one, um, this always makes me laugh because uh, people, people say, oh, I want to get into cybersecurity because I really love computers. I really love like doing this stuff. I really want to, um, I really want to do that. And then, and then the first thing I tell them is, well, you're going to be working with people. Like cybersecurity is people because um, your normal cybersecurity team is not empowered doesn't own the systems they're going to be securing right you're you're going to be working and your influence through other people right maybe if you're an incident response you're you're going to not work with people because you're going to be doing forensics but um even as a red teamer you know everything we did had to be boiled down to a report and it had to be boiled down to uh something that could be understood and if you couldn't demonstrate to a person what the risk was, what the problem was. Um, it was, you know, you could own a whole bunch of things, but you weren't going to get anywhere, right? And and uh, that's kind of the thing that I like to fixate on is I don't necessarily want to own all the things. I want to fix all the things. Owning all the things is a step to fixing all the things, right? Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, unexpected element of this is people are a key part of it. Um, obviously, you're going to need the technical knowledge, but don't ever forget the people element. Fair. Uh, <laughs> definitely a valuable input there. Um, so knowing that people are there, it's pretty, I guess, um, inherent, intrinsic to what the role is and being successful. What's one p piece of advice that you would you wish you would have known starting out? Were you already aware um, of that? Or is that something that you learned the more that you did your job and was like, hey, you know, I, I am going to have some quote unquote soft skills, as they say, is in order to articulate what it is that the concerns are, what the threats are, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of vaguely aware of it, but I, what I wasn't aware of is how much I was bad at it, you know. <laughs> um, and so it's one of those things where, uh, there's plenty of resources if you want to become a better speaker. There's plenty of resources if you want to learn to like listen better. Um, but I don't know that they that people are told to engage with them. Um, like, for example, uh, like a very senior engineer took me under his wing, and and he would re regularly say to me like, Leo, you can't, you can't voice your opinion like this, and you can't uh, say a negative thing about the idea, like. It may not be the greatest idea, but, and, you know, you as a red teamer are intending, are going to then compromise the system because it's a bad idea, but you can't say that to their face, right? You can't make them think that it's an adversarial relationship um, because it's really not. Are you talking about like saying like, hey, that's a dumb idea, or are you saying like, you know, nobody would ever, <laughs> you know, try to do that? Um. So... You know, it's funny because I don't rem I no longer remember exactly what I was like the things that got me in trouble exactly, but it was things like, you know, 
um, somebody brought up um, a piece of software that maybe had some blatant vulnerabilities as a pen tester, you know, like you're like, oh, well, this this thing is running like old versions of the X or um, is running software that's completely unnecessary or, you know, uh, you're talking to somebody and they um, and they say, well, we want to do it this way. And you, <laughs> and I would, before I would say things like, well, why don't you just talk to the team that does that, right? Like, instead of trying to do it yourself, right? We, like stuff like, just little stuff like that, where like, you don't realize that you're turning the conversation <laughs> into an adversarial one, right? Um, that's why I always try to tip. We lost to you. Okay. Sorry about that. What was the last thing I said? Um, I think you were saying that's why you um but I didn't know where you were going with that thought because it went out exactly as it was getting good. I was like, yes, <laughs> that's why I ah Sorry, this. Sorry, technical problems. No worries. No worries. The beauty Is of this editing, better? we'll chop it all out. <laughs> yeah, we can still hear. Can't hear you if you're talking. Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry about that. I, I don't know why this laptop did this. Um you're okay. <laughs> anyway, um I didn't hear you say what the last thing you heard me say was uh before. <laughs> um, we were talking about the relationships don't have to be adversarial. Uh, and then it sounded like you were about to make a new point, but because uh, you were in transition, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was gonna say like, um, the relationships don't have to be adversarial. And so like, uh, one of the things I picked up from another, um, uh, from an architect while I was a red teamer is he would say, you know, we're here to add value, right? We're not, we're not here to, um, knock ideas or anything like that. So. Um, I, I always try to keep that in mind and try to couch everything in that terminology of, hey, we're here to add value or so, because you don't realize, or at least I didn't realize when I was younger, um, a lot of the things you say, the tone matters and already people are coming in thinking like, all oh, these security guys are just going to like be negative about the entire thing, or they're going to say no, or they're just going to add some like random requirements. So you got to reframe that relationship as much as possible as soon as possible um, when you're doing security. How does that, how do you define that, the adding value? Um, and that can be, you can answer that either at work, um, you, the person, how, what does that look like? How do you measure whether or not that value has been added or how do you define adding value? Yeah, I mean, sometimes for the depending on the project, like sometimes it's not um, as as a red teamer, for example, like you don't. You, sometimes all you have is that red team hammer, right? All you have is the vulnerabilities. All you have is the things you compromise, whatever else, right? Um, but sometimes your report is going to get um, lifted up and carried to someone who can make a decision, right? So, um, you can you can do things in in your report you know maybe they're not always appreciated but you can do things in your report like hey this technology may work that team as you get to know your organization you can do things like and this is part of the reason i transitioned from red teamer to architect right because i kept doing that and people were like dude you need to like 
just let them do the thing. Um, so, you know, there, there's value there. And then there's also the whole um, demonstrating to people that they can trust you. And, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of play when you have like a vulnerability and you don't necessarily have to um, immediately escalate it, immediately take it to somebody, right? You can say like, hey, I noticed this vulnerability. Like, I think you can fix it real quick. You know, I mean, if you have a reporting structure that's very like rigid or whatever, you can't do that. But there's just a lot of things you can play with to make people understand that you're on their side um, and that you're not trying to just, you know, be the cog in the giant machine that's grinding down and like telling them to the how they have to do things and that they can't do try new things and stuff like that. Um, I think that's interesting because um, I think my my perspective um, as a pen tester has always been on an external pen testing team. So, you know, we didn't necessarily have those relationships to maintain long term. It's usually yep. like maybe like a two or three week engagement where you're going in and you're, you know, you're doing whatever you do. You tell them what's going on. They may, you know, fix it or not. Um, and then, you know, they may go come back to you and tell you to fix it again later. But you don't necessarily need to um, maintain those relationships. Um, I think I have seen that very much so from a testing perspective, just coming from a testing background in terms of, you know, whenever there's new software, you know, it's always adversarial, I think, by definition, just because the nature of what you do, you know, I think both as a tester and as a, a, a penetration tester is to point out vulnerabilities or errors that someone may have made in the design and the implementation of the system, which can be by nature very adversarial. So. Yep. Um, but I, I, I did, I've never thought about that. Um, I, I'm not a fan of, of people as a whole. Um, I tend to not like people. I agree. Um, so, um, I <laughs> tend to try to do things that require the least amount of human interaction possible. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I think that there very much so is in cybersecurity an aspect of, you know, maintaining those relationships and, you know, making sure that you're engaging stakeholders and things of that nature that people don't talk about, especially when you're talking about, um, you know, hey, these are the perks or the the non-perks of, of a particular job. Yeah, and and I think you you hit on something very interesting that I forget that I always forget to mention because I only have my experiences to go off, right? Is I was I was internal my entire career. I've been internal my entire career. Um, so like, you know, starting out as an auditor, one of the first things they teach you is like, don't, you know, you may be the auditor, you may have the audit hammer, but these people are going to be, um, you're going to be sitting across the table from these people, audit after audit after audit. So you really don't want to, um, you really want to keep the relationship friendly and you really want to be respectful of their time and all that. And, and you really want to like, see what you can do to once again add value um but yeah you, you're absolutely right I, I can't speak to the external pen tester um though um i think they're incredibly valuable i think the being able to operate outside of the political influence is such a great gift um maybe i should give it a try someday yeah i agree um i i i think that there's definitely benefits to it um i i also see on the other side though the the benefit that comes with like when you have like the red teams and the blue teams and the the purple teams and the you know basically everybody working together to you know improve the security of the system i i think that that makes sense but you know the reality is that i think a lot of folks when they do their pen tests they end up have to do them for a uh, compliance related release reason and it's mm -hmm. usually somebody external to the job right so where you may have internal you know red teams um generally the ones that are you know that count quote unquote are the external ones that you have to do yeah i mean for sure so it was it was really interesting um because a lot of a lot of my work ended up being like not hey can you get uh, domain admin but hey what can you do with this application just this application right um and and so that made it so much more restrictive and and i was operating outside of this of the normal scopes of of pen tests because nobody the teams that were going to test to see if they could get to domain admin were doing that right and mm -hmm. they were external uh, and and us we were like 
okay, what's going to happen? We were more concerned about what's going to happen if uh, a developer turn goes rogue or an insider thread goes rogue or somebody manages to not get domain admin, but um, hijack an account and, and start shenanigans, right? Um, that was like the thing we were worried about more. So since you've moved over um, to doing auditing, have you have you had any regrets? Do you miss the the technical um, aspects of the things that you've learned, or do you find that this is uh, much more in line with you know what you you want to be doing? Um, I miss it really badly. Um, I was part of a great team, um, and um, and uh, you know the 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 stuff the skill sets I were I was building were just a lot of fun, right? Like I was. Um, I was getting good with, um, uh, because one of the organization I worked for was so large, I was getting good with, uh, exploiting vulnerabilities at, at massive scales. Um, but at the same time, um, it is really cool to be able to like build those relationships and build trust and, um, focus on one technology stack and not just breaking things. Um. Because you know, I, I may be, uh, I may just be consulting, but I'm also focusing on trying to build out my own infrastructure. Um, because to me, that's more interesting, and I also kind of have this hope to someday um, be a developer who red teams. <laughs> because Ooh. the develop the developer world is just so out there, right? Like, um, I don't think you can keep up with developers as a red teamer, unless you are actually developing yourself, like on all the things that they're developing on, right? Like CICD pipelines are so interesting and complex and, um, you know, God, Kubernetes, <laughs> I still haven't wrapped my head around Kubernetes. Not that I've like had any opportunity to really try. Um, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm doing now. I enjoyed, I miss what I did before, but I think it's a, I'll eventually get back to the tech focused um, work, even if it's not entirely red teaming. Interesting. So you mentioned being a builder, being a breaker, being, you know, Tanisha called out blue team, red team, purple team. Sometimes one experience can inform the other. Having experience in one can make you better in the other. It's kind of like striking a balance and then you're always trying to learn and yep. uh, grow as the field grows. How do you find balance or, and I know sometimes that that's uh, subjective for each person, um, but how do you find balance in that on a professional side? And then with all of the learning and all of the improving and the adjustment, then how do you find balance with your personal life and avoiding um, <laughs> burnout? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the what I found is I just have, I just try to focus on what I need for the role. Um, um, when I was a red teamer, I was constantly studying, um, you know, uh, it, it was really funny because even, even within like red teaming, like even if you are a red teamer, right. Um, you know, I just laid out all the things, like the things that my team focused on versus other teams. So like as a red teamer, I started studying for the OSCP and realized halfway through that the material didn't apply to the role I was, I was doing. Um, and it, it really sucked because I was like, okay, I can continue to grind through this get good at curb roasting, get good at like compromising um, uh, AD, uh, buffer overflows, all that stuff. Or I can accept that I currently do not need this and grind out, um, was it Burp Academy? Mm. Right, so- Burp Suite Academy. Burp Suite Academy, yeah. Or grind out like as many things in Burp Suite Academy you can because at the time that was the, the work that was coming down the pipe, right? So I think- um, balance may be a myth and mm -hmm. you just kind of have to do what the role requires of you. Um, at least that's, that's what I've found. Um, and sometimes that requires that you throw away balance and focus heavily on the thing that will get you the most bang for your time in that moment. And, and that's like the other thing, the other component of how do you balance your personal life and how do you avoid burnout is you stop trying to do everything. <laughs> Right. Um, and I say that, but um, I'm also, you know, helping volunteering to run two communities and all that stuff. So uh, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. 
I was going to say uh, one of the things that we always talk about on here um, is like this concept of uh, world domination, which is like, you know, yes, you're in a place and you want to make sure that you excel and, and represent that job in the best way possible. But, you know, I think at the same time, like, you know, where do you want to end up? What is your end goal? What are you working towards? Right. So not necessarily. um you know, doing all the things, but I think making continual progress towards whatever your ultimate goal is. So um, I guess with that uh, background information, like how do you think someone who maybe is in a position that they want to get good at, but then that's not necessarily the position that they want to end up in, um, how do you think that they should approach that? Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm lucky enough that I, I work in cybersecurity. So anything I learn is going to carry forward in the next position. Um, but if you're in a position where you absolutely know that um, you're not going to be using the, that skill set, uh, well, first of all, there's no such thing as a useless skill. So I'd say like, you know, there, there's, there is a lot to be gained and, and, and never forget that there's a lot to be gained from every piece of experience you get. So even if your role isn't great, if there's something to be mastered there, you know, do that with... Uh, a little bit of joy in your heart, but then also um, it depends on how much free time you have, right? Like that secondary skill, um, you just have to find the ways to maximize the learning experience for that secondary skill, right? One of the things for me that was a big sort of wake up call for me was that um, I don't learn well from just textbooks, right? So if, if I wanted to learn a skill, I had to go out and do it and drill it and drill it again, right? And um, if I could drill for like 20 minutes, it would be better than trying to read the textbook for an hour, right? So find the things that work for you, find the things that um, you can slip into your life easily, Th find the things that like make you happy, right? Uh, when you do it, because that way the burnout is mitigated a little bit, right? And then, you know, don't forget to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> try, try not to lose sleep. The, that sleep you lose, uh, yeah, that sleep you lose will come back to haunt you in uh, the form of bad decisions or, not learning as well or whatever else. You mentioned the things that bring you joy. Um, and then earlier you said there were two other organizations, I guess, that you're working with. Um, do you want to delve a little bit deeper there and tell us about those? Yeah. Um, so um, for a long time, I, I used to run an organization that I, that I called uh, Security Shell. Um, I got it up to about a thousand people um, but then like the burnout um, got a little too intense. Uh, my girlfriend kept saying things like, you know, you need to stop doing some of this stuff. So I finally gave up on it. Um, and uh, a friend of mine took it over and he renamed it as the DC215 chapter, um, which I'm like super glad that somebody revived DC215 because that's an awesome organization. Um, and so now he runs it and I volunteer for him. Uh, so super, super glad um, that that's happening. And, and that's just, that just is an opportunity to meet people who are doing interesting stuff, get hands-on experience, um, you know, meet newbies, meet senior people. It's great. Um, and then the other one is uh, an organization called uh, John Con, which is a new security conference in the Philadelphia area focused on technology. Um, run by uh, Russell Handorf, who is just uh, a mad genius, um, super into hardware stuff, stuff like that. So, you know, I get to be on those message boards when they uh, hash out really cool like projects. Um, he had this radio, he had this teletype that you could tweet to. Um, oh no, at the conference, it was actually, the teletype was printing out every single word spoken by the uh, speakers. So that was like a really cool project that he did just because, you know, he enjoyed it, right? He got joy from building this really cool hardware project um, and he did it. Um, and actually, so my mistake, three organizations, because I also run Tool Philadelphia <laughs> with the same fr uh, friend who runs um, DC215. So three organizations. And like I said, don't do too much. Go sleep, be with your loved ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Definitely you probably, one of those do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say you might be in the wrong room. This might be the support group for people who are doing way too much because uh, 
we we do the absolute most around uh, around these parts. Um, I I find it interesting though um, that you like myself um, do so many things with so many people when you don't also do not like people. Um, I I find that super interesting, like how that happens and works out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> you secretly do like people. It's just no. certain people, maybe. No, no, no that's okay. Not it. No, no. All right. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure that's not it. Also, <laughs> yeah. Well, you like the people that you do like. I do. I do. And I feel like you probably commit extra to those people. You're just selective, <laughs> quality over quantity. <laughs> I, I don't know how it is for you, but for me, it's kind of a. You know, I want, I want, what I want is to spend time with my girlfriend and just relax with my dog. Uh, what I actually end up doing is an idea gets stuck in my head and I'm like, you know, this should happen. Someone should do this. And then I bug, I like bug the people around me and they're like, yeah, yeah, but we're not going to do it. And I'm like, fine, I'll do it. (laughs) And and then that happens like three or four times in a year. And you're just like, Jesus, I'm doing this to myself. Yeah. Stop coming up with good ideas. Turn your mind off. (laughs) And I can tell you that the secret to turning your mind off just don't tell anyone, okay? Watching trash te- TV. Like, I don't even <laughs> think about my own life when I'm, like, ensconced in everyone else's. <laughs> oh, my God. See, I think that's my weakness is I, I, I can't, right? Um, although, yeah, um, I, I got to try giving Bridgerton a chance, right? I that, was just count? going to suggest, except Bridgerton is not trash. That's right. I was like, <laughs> Bridgerton isn't trash. I shouldn't. I shouldn't say that. So in in my mind, anything that's not helping you take over the world is trash. So Ah. um, it is peak trash. It is excellent trash, but it is still. We were just talking about, I got some valuable quotes uh, from Leo here. One, cybersecurity is people. What is Bridgerton if not uh, an observation into the vicissitudes of personalities and uh, politics? um, Absolutely. How people interact with one another. So the argument could be made that it does inform my world domination because I can see how to navigate certain um, situations. That sounds like a talk is loading. Ooh, yeah. Bridgerton, a cybersecurity. Sorry, go ahead, Leo. <laughs> I, <laughs> no, down no, that detour. No. I mean, that's a great one, but um, something that might be fun for your talk is um, Isaac Asimov had, um, you know, the, the iRobots, uh, I robot the the one he the the book he wrote about artificial intelligence and like robotics and there's one there's one <laughs> there's one um short story in there that I remember which is he uh they accidentally developed a robot that could read people's thoughts right and the thing with that robot was because it could read people's thoughts it could lie to people um and so the, the whole Bridgerton, like learning people, understanding people thing made me think of that robot and, and this, the, the, the robot who would lie because he could understand people's feelings and emotions and could therefore interpret harm on a whole nother level, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't know, random random thought, maybe I- No, I think that's good. Um, since you're, you mentioned different things that you get involved in, um, SquadCon, is uh, our conference that we have it annually. It's coming up in August. Um, we could probably, uh, if nothing else, <laughs> some of the things that we discussed here will inform a talk that I present or we could co-present about how understanding uh, human psychology makes for either better attackers or better defenders or both. Interesting. So it's basically a case in social engineering. The social part is a pretty huge... Um, aspect of that you know i I was gonna say i I referenced uh queen charlotte in my uh one of my talks last year (laughs) yeah i was i was gonna say a big corporation you know uh, it's it's got their big corporations have their queen charlotte right um but i was you know it's really interesting that you're talking about this talk because i wanted to do a talk about um the attitudes people adopt once they figure out once they figure you out Mm. Because, you know, um, I saw this happen in my last company, like a new CISO came in, they were very effective, they made a lot of changes, but then people figured out how to get around her or how to like 
blow smoke up her mm-hmm. sorry maybe not the best term um and all of a sudden things just started getting a little like all the positive gains were lost because of the new politic of the new politics that emerged that like the new players I wasn't I wasn't sure how to develop that one without you know <laughs> potentially <laughs> stepping on a huge landmine but uh, maybe it is just the psychology of it and and abstract away from what I saw and just focus on human psychology. Yeah, it'd definitely be great to at least talk about it a little bit more, Rebecca. I do. And there's another one. I don't like people, but I need them. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. That should be like the whole theme behind like the cyber security as an industry. <laughs> well, I mean... We're not we're in good company apparently because Microsoft is determined to replace us all with open AI, right? So well, for AI conversations, uh <laughs> <laughs> Tanisha also has uh what's your um the dissertation or thesis or what's oh yeah, what's um, I'm doing for that? a dissertation on offensive AI. So basically the use of um AI in developing uh tools to train uh future cybersecurity professionals, uh, specifically red teamers. So whether or not a uh, red teamer or whether or not AI assisted tools help people learn better than just, you know, regular standard tools that are static in, in nature. Um, so I'm just going to be working on that basically for the next year or so. So I've been diving headfirst into all things AI um, over the past year or so. So are you like trying to figure out um... I'm thinking of how this would work. Would it be just like a just-in-time learning? So I'm I'm thinking that it'll basically, um, you know, based off of the the way that a person thinks or you know what they may how they may approach a problem, like adapt and evolve based on that, right? So whereas you know if you start off and you're saying like, hey, these are the 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 tools or these are the things that I would do as a red teamer. I'm going to you know do my scanning. I'm going to do my whatever, you know, go through the phases. Um, and then, you know, if it's like, hey, based off of, you know, what they select or what options are, are chosen, does that change the the severity or the 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 way that people critically think about things or the way that things they, they problem things? If if the AI assistance, you know, helps them to find better defects and find better vulnerabilities, for example, as opposed to, you know, if you just say, hey, I'm going to approach this as a static checklist type of vibe Mm -hmm. where I'm going to go and do, you know, X, Y, and Z. And, you know, I'll find the same type of vulnerabilities, you know, every time because I'm basically doing the same types of things, right? So it's, you know, what is the evolution of offensive AI going to look like in terms of, you know, how AI can help um, improve um, hackers of the future, because we know at some point anything that is low level, repeatable, um, is going to be probably taken over by AI, right? So there's going yep. to be at some point where you know AI is not reliable at this point, um, you know, and you need critical thinking, you need um, problem solving st- skills, for example. So um, I'm going to try to see like, hey, how do we figure out what that point is, and you know, how does this um, improve the outcomes of uh, red teamers or business security professionals. Nice. Yeah, I look forward to um to reading that dissertation if uh, whenever you publish it. I probably got like a year or so to go. Yeah. Um, oh, sure. <laughs> so, w- what do you think about the? I guess the future of cybersecurity. What do you, What do you um you know think is going to be different in the future? Um, do you think AI is going to Im- have an impact, or you know, how do you think that that might impact what it is that you do? Um. I was I was listening to somebody and I'm, I I don't recall the quote, but I think um, but someone was saying, right now we need to consider AI like code and we need to check it like code. Um, in w- which is to say, you know, it's it's good for certain tasks, but we gotta we gotta check that those edge cases don't sneak in uh don't sneak in there too much, right? Um, so I think short term the future of AI is gonna um require a lot of checking. Um, but long term, I absolutely, I absolutely think uh, we're going to be seeing things like, um, you know, uh, an AI that ingests the vulnerabilities, like ingests a whole bunch of vulnerabilities and maps on your network. Like, could anyone even get to it? Um, right through some through a series of, I don't know, um, and map scans and other things. Um, right. So I, I think 
vulnerability management is going to benefit from it. Um, compliance, I think, is going to be tricky because there's so many humans who are going to be saying so many things and arguing in so many ways that you're always going to need humans to detangle the compliance piece. Um, and then code, for sure. Code's going to be a, a really, really interesting one because I'm afraid that, at least at first, bad code is going to generate more bad code. Um, and just kind of stack on itself for a bit until we figure out how to get clean, secure code into the AI so that it spits back out clean, secure code, right? Like I'm really afraid of a, of a day where the same common mistake has been used in a dozen places because the AI learned it and nobody like found it. Um, and then some red teamer finds it and it's another log for J or something like that. Yeah, I, I I think that we're going to 100% see those those types of problems because realistically, if you look at what the, the 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 data that the systems are being taught on, it's being taught on what is likely bad code. You know, it's mm -hmm. not it's probably not being only fed you know uh, secure code or you know good code. It's probably being fed like all the code. You know, yep. and mm -hmm. so when you're saying like, hey, um, chat DPT or hey, you know, whatever. Um, you know, generate a code, some code for me that does X, Y, Z, it's going to take all the different examples and it's going to extrapolate some code based on that bad code that it's already, you know, that it's learned on. Yep. So you're just going to get some more bad code, which, you know, has some vulnerabilities. And I think we'll probably also see some new ty uh, new types of attacks and, and new classes of attacks as well, just based off Absolutely. of the fact that, you know, if people are purposefully training models with, bad code and they're using it for that purpose, then, you know, that'll make my life as a, a adversary or a red teamer a lot more effective because then I'll know that you have bad code that I can, I don't know how to exploit it, you know? So yeah. I think it'll be interesting to just see how this all, you know, plays out. I think at some point we're probably going to have to scrap a lot of the models that we have just because of the fact that the data is in fact, uh, in fact, bad. Yeah. Right. Um, that's definitely that's definitely something I agree with. Um, all these models right now were made from using avail everything available, right? So, but then like who's gonna make the new, who's gonna make the new models, right? Like the, the AI can't evolve. Um, you know, you the, the AI can't evolve based on its own sort of ruminations yet, and it 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 can't think and elevate, right? You almost have that weird element of humanity moves forward in spurts because somebody figures out something really, really cool. And then we normalize on that. And then a couple decades later, somebody else figures out something really cool, but the AI is never going to figure out new, really cool things. It'll find all the stuff it can find, but it, it, it may not innovate. Well, um, I mean, I think until we, <laughs> I was about to say, until we get to the point where that you have like the the ASI, the artificial super intelligence, which are supposed to be able to, you know, be innovative and be able to act autonomously, autonomously. Um, I think at that point when we get there, you know, they'll be able to generate clean code because it realizes what's bad and has self-awareness and all of those things. But yeah. I don't think we're anywhere near there. Um, no. Maybe somebody is, but I don't think commercially, you know, mainstream life where they're um, so as far as you, um, you know, how do you continue to learn and grow in, in your field? Um, yeah, I just, I grind it out and I, um, I try to attend as many conferences and events as I can and, you know, talk to people like yourself. So a lot of my learning, like I mentioned, I, I figured out early on that my, my learning doesn't happen, um, as efficiently as it could when I'm like in a textbook. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, a lot of audiobooks, a lot of uh, YouTube videos, um, a lot of conversations. When I and when I absolutely cannot avoid it, that's when I go to white papers <laughs> and textbooks. Um, anything to sort of like uh, keep the enjoyment in the process um, and prevent the burnout. Because um, yeah, at the, at the at the worst part of my burnout, I just I would reread the same sentence over and over and over again, and. It was just evident that perhaps textbook learning was not for me. It is so crazy the way that works because I am like the exact opposite. Like I will start with paper. I will start with books. 
Um, and then if I need to, then I will go to to videos. But I, I have a hard time focusing when I'm um, watching videos or listening people talk because like, uh, I think just the way that my ADHD is set up, they'll say something that makes me think of something else. And you know what I'm saying? Like when I'm reading, it's just, I'm reading the words as they are and I'm not catching like, you know, ideas or thoughts or things of that nature. I'm just reading it and consuming it. So it, it, it's interesting how that works. Yeah, I think the presentation of my ADHD is such that I need to be moving around and like doing other stuff. And that's why the, the videos work for me. Um, paper, it, it's just physically painful for me to be still. I mean, you know, unless I like wear myself down as much as possible exercising, right? Um, but <laughs> I think maybe that was part of the burnout. I wasn't able to do that because I was already, you know, so right. yeah, so um. But I will say, if you haven't tried listening to a video at 2x speed, it's really interesting. That's actually how I, I do things when I do watch them is I'll listen to them at, because okay. then they talk fast enough that I have to basically exactly. um, pay attention in order to know what's going on. Because they're, the space in between the words is just like, there's too many like moments for me to think but at you know 2x. Um, but that's how I'll, I'll watch like random things on YouTube, like people putting together like... Um, uh, log houses and woods or mm -hmm. turning yep. camper vans into tiny homes and other garbage that I I do in between uh, thoughts. Um, so what what is the best career related advice that you've ever received? Ooh. Um, that's a tough one. Um, I think it's probably it's, it's probably something we've already said, but um, which is like pick pick your pick your thing and go towards that right um and and so this was this was told to me by a, a senior pen tester at um at the telecommunications company um he told me leo i decided i didn't want to mess with windows and i have made a career of not touching windows and you know that really <laughs> it really resonated with me because um, you know, like I was going through the OSCP materials and I was just like, man, this Windows hacking, like it's it's really dry. You know, I'd rather be poking like a web app or I'd rather be like on Linux um, Same friend. or cloud. Right. And and he just went, dude, find what you want. And if you feel like if if uh, if Microsoft doesn't bring you joy, then you, know, you don't have to. There's there's a thousand amazing windows pen testers out there like you don't have to be that person you don't have to go for that job if you don't feel inspired by it right so is that like slow methodical figuring out what is not for you and then whatever's left you know hopefully is great so what do you hope to achieve in the next uh, few years wow i don't know um yeah, it's with the departure from that telecommunications company and uh, no longer being a red teamer. Um, it it really sort of changed my goals. So like right now I'm like unsure. Uh, I know I want to do good work and I want to you know help people and all that stuff, but I don't I don't know um, specifically. I think somewhere in the back of my mind, I'd like to focus on securing non-for-profits. Um, I always say that, you know, if I ever get to the point where I can retire, I'll retire to do security, but for non-for-profits, right? Um, you know, so, but in the next couple of years, I think I'm just going to try and um, work on not being a burnt out wreck and not doing so many stuff, so many things. <laughs> Look, uh, whenever you get ready to retire, we volunteer as tribute. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we'll be your first uh, nonprofit if you want. Oh, my God. But you know what's really funny is just like, you guys are an awesome nonprofit that, um, so all right, I have this, I have this um, business idea. Well, not, not business idea, training model, right? Because we have so many juniors that need good training and we have so many non-for-profits that need um, security help. And, you know, if a, if a senior volunteers some percentage of their time, 
and we've got all these juniors that need training, man, we could do a lot of securing with that, right? Like the properly structured a couple hours from a senior could get a bunch of juniors moving in the right direction, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, and you know, it's funny that you say like you, you volunteer this, your organization, but like, I don't know that I could secure your organization better than you could, right? <laughs> like, I don't know how I would add value there. I try to figure it out for sure. Yeah, I, I think that we have um, a lot of different uh, folks um, who are doing amazing things. Like Beck is, um, uh, I think, a blue teamer, um, if, I, uh, if I'd guess. Um, and I am a red teamer. We've got so many different folks that are in different areas of cybersecurity. Um, and I, I think that, you know, just having a collection of different folks has been very helpful for us, um, just in terms of... Um, you know, having different skill sets. So we do okay. But, you know, as a nonprofit, you can always use, use more help. Right. Um, this time is a limited resource. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so how can someone who's interested um, in your career field uh, get started today? Like if they wanted to, like, they're like, hey, I think I might want to be um, an auditor or, hey, I might want to be an architect or whatever. Um, what does that look like? What would you recommend? Um. Well, it depends on where they're starting, right? Um, I, I always say this to people when like people who are like telling me like, oh, hey, I really want to do X, Y, or Z. I'm like, okay, where are you today, right? Like, are you um, are you just about to graduate from a university uh, in comp sci? Which like, you know, ideally uh, that would be the thing that um, you did, right? Because that's the most straight path. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you're going to have uh, some sort of, you're going to have a different path, right? So for me, for example, I graduated with an accounting degree and I basically had to take these massive detour through audit to get to security. Um, so one, where you start um, matters, but two, um, pick your, like, if, if you have the destination in mind, then just start mapping it out, right? Like, you're not going to be able to go from, I don't know, teacher to security architects, right? But you can go from teacher to project manager, or teacher to um, maybe developer, right? Um, security architects is a, is, a, is a weird role. So I would actually be really surprised if someone goes, I want to be a security architect. Right. Um, I would be more expectant. Someone says, hey, I want to be a blue teamer or a red teamer or, um, you know, compliance, GRC. Yeah, you never know because um, they have uh, things where they may be like, hey, security architects make dumb money. And so somebody may be like, I want to make dumb money. This is what I want to do. Well, I mean, that's like, yeah, that's like the, that's the kid telling me that he wants to get a CISSP when he like hasn't graduated yet. Like I had that happen once. Like, oh yeah, my plan is to like graduate and get my CISSP. Okay, it's it's a good plan. Um, the CISSP is a management certification, right? You're gonna graduate, and you're gonna get a management certification. Um, like if you want to do that, sure. But like, what are you actually trying to achieve with that CISSP? You want you want the skills to get the job, then maybe figure out what job you want, right? Not not that the CISSP is bad, just you can't go from student to manager certificate and expect that something magical is going to happen for you. Um, you know, work, work on completing that path. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that meme, the, there's a meme out there, the kid trying to skip three steps. Like. Yeah. Trying to step up uh, three yeah. steps on the stairway or whatever. Yeah. Skipping, like skipping, like basic networking and like web app to to get the pen testing right like um yeah i mean i don't know that i have any specific advice for like how to get to where i am because i just kind of meandered my way here but i will <laughs> say that don't don't try to skip steps um it'll really really hurt you um I, I say that as someone who um part of my burnout was because i skipped steps right because um instead of going through a sock i went through audit and that let me skip a bunch of steps um which then meant that I hadn't gotten the crap kicked out of me by a sock, <laughs> right? Um, and that's that's fundamental. And that's foundational. Um, you go from being an auditor to being a security architect, and like people are going like, 
what are you doing here, dude? You're an auditor. <laughs> right. Um, That's still encouraging, though, because part of the reason we have this uh, podcast is to let folks know the different roles that exist, the different paths that people follow. And I think sometimes people talk themselves out of their capability because it wasn't the straight path. So sometimes whenever anyone can hear from someone like yourself who was like, yeah, I might have taken I might have meandered, like you said, or taken an unconventional path. But I still got here and uh, am adding value and being productive in the role. And I think that's that's also necessary for the folks who are either a career changer or they finally figured out that cybersecurity is a thing for them a little bit later in life, um, that wherever you start, and that kind of circles back to what you just um, said about as far as uh, getting started in the field, where are you and what what's your goal? And it's still attainable as long as you chart and map accordingly. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I definitely don't want to discourage anyone. Um, like, I just want to emphasize chart and map accordingly and, and mm -hmm. try not to skip steps. Or if you're going to skip a step, just be aware that the the skipping of a step will have a consequence later in your career. Like, maybe it'll just be like an embarrassing comment, or um, maybe it'll just be like a couple weekends spent studying some material that you like are not the strongest in, right? Right. But just don't. I guess really what I'm trying to say is don't be in a rush to get to that dream role because when you get to that dream role, like no one's going to hold your hand. You're going to be expected to perform. Right. Uh, Absolutely so, agree with you. I mean, I think that's yeah. solid, uh, solid advice. I mean, because uh, a lot of folks try to, you know, like you said, skip the steps and, you know, not build a solid foundation. And, and I've seen throughout, you know, my life that it, it develops problems later on. So I, I think, you know, hey, make sure you build a, a solid foundation before you start, you know, adding in the additional floors is is super valid um, yeah. advice. Or be prepared to supplement it in other ways. So like on a yeah. practical way of, if you don't want to eat vegetables, <laughs> you're still going to have to get your vitamins somehow, you yep. know? Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's kind of the same thing. Okay, I didn't want to go this path. Well, you are still going, if you want to be well-balanced, you are going to have to supplement it some other way. So just like how you said, if it's studying on the weekends or doing whatever, um, sometimes there are shortcuts, but you do have to do things to uh, sustain once you get into the role. Like you said, uh, no one's going to be holding your hand, but then to also make sure that you are effective and you are truly adding value. Um, you might be able to circumvent, but you still have to supplement. Yep. Yeah, and I think it just goes back to the work-life balancing, really. Uh, it's it's kind of like... The more you skip, the more your work-life balance is going to suffer. Um, mm. And so I would encourage people not to do that as, uh, you know, as a current burnout who's <laughs> doing too much. <laughs> Ideal. Well, I thank you so much for your time today. I know uh, Tanisha kind of, she mentioned, you know, what was your, um, what do you hope to achieve in the next few years and things like that? I think we asked a pretty wide breadth of questions. Is there anything that you want to, uh, the main target of the, these conversations are members who are wanting to gain exposure to different folks who are in the field, hear different paths. Is there any parting words of wisdom or even cautionary uh, words that you want to share uh, with them that you wanna make sure is said? Um, yeah, get involved. Um, you know, I, I joke that I got my start in this field because I hung around until I got a job. Um, but that's not a joke, right? I, I got involved. So like, you're, you know, there's your, uh, there's going to be your like, uh, DC groups, your B sides, all that stuff. If you don't have one, run one. Right. Um, a lot of the time, because I was running things, I was meeting very, very senior people who, um, were very nice to me and took the time to mentor me because they met me because I was on a group. Like I once, um, I've gotten jobs off of thing of like people knowing me as the person who ran things or just like was there, um, at the event. Right. So, you know, um, get involved with your group, get involved with any groups. Um, and, you know, and know that you're like, you are allowed to be there. You are valid to be there and you may not have the experience, but you can ask questions and you can say, Hey, like I am trying to become this person. Um, and that's totally a fair thing to say. And a totally a fair thing to, uh, to be the reason why you attend events.
Thank Any uh, last minute things that you'd like to plug? Anything coming up? Um. Well, I mean, I know I'm not a volunteer for Rice's, but I will say uh, Rice's Philadelphia. Um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with Eric. Uh, John Con is coming up in October. Uh, DC 215 is not currently having any summer events, but if you want to track us down, um, DC 215 cybersecurity on Google. Um, let's see, can I do a QR code? Uh, that mm -hmm. didn't work. Yeah, uh, the Earth is showing up in the middle of it. All right. Well, yeah. that was that was the. John if you want to send it to me, code. I'll I'll put it on the uh um in the in the caption. That was the John Con QR code. Um, and yeah, just there's a lot of stuff happening. Get involved. Awesome. All right. Well, I want to uh, thank you, uh, Leo, for coming and hanging out with us today, um, and everyone else for checking out another episode of Bring a Hacker to Work Day. Um, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you.